So now we know that left and right cosets of a subgroup inside of a group are just ways of taking that subgroup and moving it around to different places within its parent group by either acting on the left by other elements or acting on the right by other elements. What we claim is that these cosets are the key to understanding why Lagrange's theorem is true, that the order of any subgroup of a finite group is a divisor of the order of the whole group. I made some claims in the last video about the specific example of the whole group being A4, the alternating group on four symbols, and the subgroup being a cyclic subgroup generated by a three cycle, that I'd like to put onto a, a firmer abstract foundation in this video. I want to prove some of the claims that we made. For example, that cosets are very rarely subgroups in and of themselves, and also that there are nice correspondences between uh, different cosets, that two cosets either overlap completely and are the same, or they are totally disjoint from one another, and that also every coset is has the same number of elements as the original subgroup that's being moved around. Those are going to be the two key observations to our proof of Lagrange's theorem coming down the line, so let's prove them in this video. So here was the motivating example that we worked in in the last video. In the group A4, which has 12 elements, the subgroup generated by the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3, that's got three elements, and we found out that these three left cosets of H account for the other 3, 6, 9 elements of A4 once and only once. So it seems like these four left cosets of H partition the group A4. Furthermore, if I conjugate H by an element, say if I conjugate it by 1, 2, 4, left action and right action combined, that the result is this element, that element, that element, that result is a subgroup of H. But that all the other left cosets, this row, this row, that row, those cosets are not subgroups. And so the first thing I want to prove is that in general, left and right cosets are probably not themselves subgroups of the larger group. That the only time that they are is when we are acting on the left or acting on the right by an element which already belonged to the subgroup. So in our example, the only left and right uh, actions that give me a subgroup when I act on H are the actions by the identity, the actions by 1, 2, 3, and the actions by 1, 3, 2. That if I use any of these as the element that I'm acting on H by, then the result is going to be a subgroup. But if I apply a left or right action using any other element of the group, that it will not produce a subgroup. So let's first establish that forward implication. Suppose that my left coset AH is actually a subgroup of G. We need to then prove that that must mean that A already belonged to the subgroup H in the first place. Well, what do we know? We know for sure that because AH is by assumption a subgroup, that means the identity element of G belongs to AH. That's the identity property of a group applied to H. Because H is a subgroup, it's a group in its, uh, in its own right. And if E belongs to AH, then that must mean that there is some element H in the subgroup big H, such that E is equal to A times H. That's what it means to be in the left coset, A times the subgroup H. But if E is equal to AH, then I can solve this equation for A inverse. A inverse is equal to H. So what does that tell me? That tells me that A inverse also belongs to H. Why? Because H belongs to H by assumption, right? And A inverse is equal to H. On the other hand, A is the inverse of A inverse. So once I know that A inverse belongs to H, by the inverse property of groups, the inverse of A inverse must belong to H also. So by the inverse property, we see that A belongs to H. So if I know that the left coset AH is a subgroup of G, then I know that A must have belonged to H in the first place. That's the forward direction. We proved it for left coset. The proof for right cosets is analogous. So now let's establish that backwards direction. Let's assume that A is an element of H. What we want to do is prove that AH is a subgroup of G. So how are we going to do that? Well, any time our burden of proof is show such and such as a subgroup, I like subgroup tests. So let's apply the one-step subgroup test to see why this must be true. The one-step subgroup test applied to the subset, the coset, AH. So there the burden of proof is to show that for any two elements of AH, X and Y, that X times the inverse of Y also belongs to the set AH. 
So we let the universe pick an X and a Y out of the coset AH, arbitrarily. By definition of AH, that must mean that there are elements of H, call them H1 and H2, such that X is A times H1 and Y is A times H2. So now, to meet my burden of proof, I need to be able to say something about the product x times y inverse. Now that I know that x and y have this form, let's just apply that form to the expression x, y inverse. It's going to be quantity a, h inverse, uh, sorry, quantity a, h1 times the quantity a, h2 inverse. Hitting that with the shoes and socks principle, that's a times h1 times the inverse of h2 times the inverse of a. But what do we know about these things? We know that h1 is an element of h by definition of h1, that's where this came from. We know h2 inverse is an element of h also because h2 is an element of h and by being a subgroup h has the inverse property, so h2 inverse belongs to h. We also know that a inverse belongs to h. How do we know that? Because at the outset we assumed that a was an element of h. And since H is a group in its own right, it has the inverse property, therefore A inverse belongs to H. So when you squint at this expression, what you see is A multiplied by three consecutive elements of H. And what do I get when I multiply together elements of H? By the closure property, I get an element of H. So this expression is A times some element of H, therefore this expression belongs to the left coset AH. And so we've satisfied the burden of proof for the one-step subgroup test. Therefore, A H is a subgroup of G. So the only time that a coset of H is itself also a subgroup of H is when the element that we're choosing to multiply to make this coset, when that element belonged to the subgroup originally. And in fact, we can even make a stronger statement. Which subgroup is A H and H A when A is already an element of H. Looking again at our example of A4 and the subgroup generated by the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3, the question is, what subgroup am I going to get by applying, say, a left action by one of these three elements? Let's say I apply a left action by 1, 3, 2. What subgroup am I going to get? Well, it turns out that that subgroup is exactly the same as the original subgroup H. It's a left coset, but it also happens to be a subgroup. The same thing is true when I left act by 1, 2, 3. Still the same subgroup as I had originally. It's a left coset, but it happens to be a subgroup, namely the same as the subgroup H itself. So is that true in general? When A belongs to H, is it true that AH is actually the same as H? And the answer is yes. And the reason for it is just the closure property. Kind of the closure and inverse properties if you think about it. So if I left multiply all these elements by 1, 2, 3, where do they go? Well, 1, 2, 3 times the identity is going to give me 1, 2, 3 itself, which belonged to H by assumption. 1, 2, 3 times itself, in this example, gave me 1, 3, 2. That's an element of H for sure, because H is a group and therefore has the closure property. 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3. Both of those are elements of H, and so their product has to be an H. Same thing with 1, 2, 3 times 1, 3, 2. That will also be guaranteed to be an element of H by the closure property for H. It just so happens it's also the identity element, because these elements are one another's inverses. But that's not so important. It's really just the closure property that tells me why when I multiply a subgroup H, all of its elements, by some element, one of its own, that the result is always just going to give me back the same subgroup. So for sure, the only cosets of H that are subgroups are H itself, and we make H itself by left multiplying by one of its own elements, or right multiplying by one of its own elements. So this is a pretty important fact about subgroups. What we want to do in our next video is to establish a series of similarly, on their own, they seem like they're kind of not that important uh, properties of how cosets work, but taken together, they're going to give us all of the theoretical machinery that we need to prove Lagrange's theorem. So in our next video, let's look at some plain vanilla facts about cosets and why they're true in a general case.